What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the first Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome into another edition of The Changeup. We break down everything that Major League Baseball has to offer as we get deeper into um, August and then obviously September right around the corner before we get ready for the playoffs to break it all down with me, as always, is my co-host. You can find Brianna at BWinner12. Miss Brianna Winner, how are you doing today? It's been a rough week in baseball and just sleep. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the dog days of summer, not just for the baseball, um, you know, the baseball players, but I think for a lot of, you know, more than likely wherever you are, you've, you've experienced the heat wave in the last well, week. I'm so. also getting ready to deal with the high school season. So, oh yeah. The deadlines of a, uh, of a journalist over there. Uh, I know. What is it? Is it Tuesday, Saturday? You get those, uh, early, early. deadlines, correct? Yeah. So, uh, nice little, um, you know, breath of fresh air before you get your crazy Tuesday deadline, uh, ahead of you. Um, oh, there there's is... no, there's nothing local. I'm okay. Oh, there you go. Perfect. All right. But it is coming. Obviously schools, uh, beginning to get rolling, um, a little bit more, um, conventional season for most high school athletics. So Brianna will be taking care of that out there, uh, in Nebraska for all the wonderful people there, but here today we are here to talk about of course major league baseball plenty to get to um begrudgingly i will update you all on the padres it is my job i have to do it i understand that but i don't want to just want to let you all know that brianna will let us know what's going on of course with the angels we have our three up three down definitely going to talk a little um hall of fame maybe uh, looking ahead to see Um, If certain players will make it in, or at least one player in particular, and we'll also kind of look at the divisional races uh, with about six weeks to go before the playoffs begin. But we will start really with um, something I did not expect to start the podcast with, um, let alone, you know, even have a, a topic for. And it was the Field of Dreams game last Thursday, obviously Dyersville, Iowa, um, it was right next to the movie set of the Field of Dreams. If you're a baseball fan, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't watched Field of Dreams, um, I don't know what you're doing, but more than likely you have. I have to imagine every baseball fan has seen Field of Dreams. And that scene in Dyersville, I, um, Iowa was absolutely incredible. I personally was not really expecting much. Um, you know, I kind of expected, you know, this and that, blah, blah, blah. You know, it'd be cool to see someone hit a home run into the corn. Um, But at the end of the day, I was kind of up in the air. I, you know, I looked at it like, you know, this is a regular season game for two teams fighting for playoff spots. You know, what are we going to truly see? And like I said, I was blown away. I'm not a huge fan of pageantry, um, you know, or at least artificial pageantry when you kind of have like the crazy cut scenes and, you know, make a, a regular season game feel like game seven of the world series. But that felt like it. Um, And the ending was fantastic. Full disclosure, I did turn the game off to watch a little bit of the Padres game. Got the update that the Yankees had actually taken the league. I switched it back and watched the Tim Anderson walk-off home run. From the beginning to the players walking out of the corn in their kind of retro, obvious kind of shoeless Joe Jackson uh, jerseys. And all the way to, you know, really the storybook ending. um, Almost Bull Durham-esque where, you know, you got Tim Anderson rounding the bases with the fireworks, not so much, you know, the lights fixture, but the fireworks going off in the background. I thought from start to finish, this was well done. And uh, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. Major League Baseball finally did something, I think, correctly. Uh, I think they did it right. But at the same time, um, I expect in the near future, they will somehow mess this up. Just, you know, knowing how Uncle Rob Manfred is. But Brianna, what were your thoughts on the Field of Dreams game in Dyersville, Iowa? Well, obviously I couldn't watch it because I was working. But uh, Kevin Costner coming out with them. And one of my coworkers is basically like, did you see, like, I think it was Stanton with the corn in his back pocket. I'm like, no. And then I watched the video and I'm like, okay, that's funny. But uh, one thing I learned as I was finding something for the paper, Tim Anderson had never seen the movie. Really? He hadn't seen the movie. 
and he basically wrote a sequel ending. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't need to see the movie now. Now it's kind of like anticlimactic, right? Like you don't even want him to watch the movie. It's just kind of like, you know what? You got your own field of dreams, homie. Yeah. And uh, those jerseys though, they could be better. Like it didn't look like, it didn't look like the Yankees changed anything. Well, but see, that's the thing. It, it is the kind of how the Yankees have been kind of through the years. I, I, I enjoyed it for what it was because obviously when you've seen Field of Dreams, no one's wearing, you know, logos, um, but it, at least the White Sox jerseys did somewhat look reminiscent of the jerseys that they wore in Field of Dreams. Now, yeah, I agree with you with the Yankees, um, but that was kind of, you know, keeping it to those. The Yankees jerseys, I think they added pinstripes and added jersey numbers. And really, that is all uh, in terms of changes. You know, it's kind of the opposite of, you know, the Oregon Ducks syndrome, where they have 12 different jerseys for every game of the year, just different colors of highlighter or neon. Um, yeah, no bueno in my mind. But um, I, I thought it was just interesting to kind of see that um, walk them walking out of the corn. Um, I didn't think I would like it. Honestly, I, I knew it was coming. I didn't think I would like it and they did it. And I don't know it. I think it's just something about, you know, knowing Field of Dreams, obviously for myself, it's a, a great movie after, you know, haven't been able to watch it since my dad passed, but it's always kind of been one of those, like what, um, you know, if you want to introduce baseball or at least a love of baseball to someone, Field of Dreams is a great way to kind of express why. Um, baseball is what it is next year obviously it has been announced the Chicago Cubs and the Cincinnati Reds will um, resume their rivalry they will do it obviously at the Field of Dreams game I think we are seeing a bit of a, a trend obviously early on the Chicago teams getting their crack at it first if you listen to the game it was obviously a pro White Sox fan base in Iowa obviously um, that's that's kind of Cub White Sox territory, um, Iowa, obviously, without a Major League Baseball team. So uh, it'll be very interesting. Brianna, what are your thoughts next year? Hopefully the Cubs will not be in the middle. Hopefully the Cubs will have won a game by the time we play next year's uh, Field of Dreams game. But um, what are your thoughts next year on to hopefully uh, see what the Cubs can do on that venue? The Cubs better have a team to even like do this yeah. because Cincinnati – is currently second and I don't think they're going to get rid of that many people and then off season so it's really up to the Cubs on what on how they want to play it and who they want in there honestly I hate that Rizzo couldn't play just because of the fact that he had COVID but everybody there even if he's a Yankee now can you imagine what like the applause and yeah everything would have been when they said his name well, you saw the, I don't know if you saw it because you were watching the game, but there was a gentleman, I think, I don't know if he was above the Yankee dugout or something, but I saw it. He, he had it. He was hanging a Rizzo Cub jersey over the, the, um, the whatever railing or whatever. I mean, he is beloved. Um, and, and not just, obviously, look, White Sox Cubs, that is a rivalry, but I agree with you. I think if Rizzo was there, he would have gotten a fantastic hand, probably from everyone on, on scene. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate, you know, like I said, that, that, and I'm not even a Cubs fan, uh, and it's still kind of like, ugh, you know, believe me, as Padres, we got our own issues, but that's a tough one, um, but it will be kind of cool to see them next year. I do hope, though, that this doesn't turn into, like, six games a year. I, I kind of look at it like the London game with the NFL. It was supposed to be once a year. Now it seems like there are four a year, and I understand. Look, it's all money-driven. You know, I'm not, I'm not naive. Um, it's kind of the same way in the NHL with the outdoor games. It used to be, you know, we're only going to do one on January 1st. Now, you know, pretty much every team has played in one in the last five years. Um, I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a ball humbug kind of guy, but we saw the negative effects, you know, the Lake Tahoe game. Uh, they, they could only play one period and essentially had to delay the game for seven hours because, you know, the sun was out. That's what happens. Unfortunately, when ice is down, uh, the sun melts it. So, um, I do hope Major League Baseball um, kind of calms the, you know, situation with this. I hope we don't see six or seven of these a year. Although knowing that the Field of Dreams game was the most watched regular season baseball game in the last 16 years, I have a feeling Major League Baseball is probably going to oversaturate this and screw it up. Once again, just going by what they normally do, unfortunately. So moving on to a bit of other news, we had some uh, milestones or at least one near milestone it was M miguel cabrera 
um, very soon, in the next week or two, more than likely, maybe by the time this podcast is dropped, um, he will have hit home run number 500 currently, 499 career home runs. I think we're both in agreement that Miguel Cabrera, um, at the at the very least, is a Hall of Famer, if not a first ballot Hall of Famer. There was one other player, though, that did hit a notable milestone. It was Joey Votto, obviously, a Cincinnati Reds. He has been on fire of late, a big reason why the Reds are making the surge that they are. He collected hit number 2,000, becomes only the second player in Major League Baseball history to record um, hit number 2,000, home run number 300, and RBI number, I believe, 2,000 um, as well, or 3,000 maybe on that, um, in the same season. But, Brianna, what are your thoughts? Is Joey Votto a Hall of Famer? Just based on that stat line, yes. I mean, we've seen people go in for less than that. So it's really up to whoever is on the committee, but I believe he is. I agree with you. Um, And I'm just verifying this. Oops. Okay, I apologize. It was 1,000 RBI. So he's only the second player to uh, record 2,000 hits. Um, 300 home runs and 1,000 RBIs all in the same season. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think he is a Hall of Famer. I don't think he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He might have to wait for a year or two. I do worry, though, because I'm surprised myself that Todd Helton isn't in the Hall of Fame. I feel there are a lot of people that are going to sit there and say, oh, well, he played in Colorado his whole career. Um, and, you know, that's a big reason why. I felt like Todd Helton was one of the best pure hitters in baseball during his time. Um, You know, obviously a notorious Padre killer, so I am biased. But I do wonder if Joey Votto gets kind of lumped into that same kind of uh, pigeonhole, if you will, where, oh, he played in Cincinnati. It's a great hitter's ballpark. Um, You know, that that helped him to the point where, you know, he's not going to make the Hall of Fame. But Uh, I agree with you. He is one of the few players, at least these days. I know batting average isn't, you know, the end all be all. And most people kind of throw it out. I'm not one of those people. He is one of those few 300, 300 guys where he's got 300 home runs and has a career batting average over 300, which I mean, look, we're, we're not in the time where, you know, guys are averaging, you know, 200 hits a year. This is, that's not how the game is played anymore. So probably won't see too, too many 3000 hit players, uh, I think probably Mike Trout is is the next closest or most realistic to get 500. Um, Giancarlo Stanton has a chance, but I don't know if he can stay healthy. But, you know, obviously Mike Trout to hit 500 is the next closest and probably 3,000. But other than that, the milestones, you know, that we used to see fall every three or four years, I don't think we will see fall too much. So moving on to some divisional races, obviously we are – finishing up the month of August, getting ready to dive into September, which is the race to the finish, if you will, of 162 game season. It all kind of comes down to that last month for a lot of teams. And uh, as we get ready, we'll, we'll kind of give you a little update on the division races. We'll start in the American League East, where at the moment, the Tampa Bay Rays have a three and a half game lead on the Boston Red Sox a a five-and-a-half game lead on the New York Yankees, and an eight-game lead on the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, In the Central, pretty much done and dusted. Uh, The Chicago White Sox have a 11-game lead on the Cleveland Indians, 11-and-a-half on the Detroit Tigers, uh, Minnesota 16 back, Kansas City 18. Interesting note on the White Sox. If the White Sox were in any other division besides the AL Central or the NL East, they would not be a first-place team. So while they have the biggest lead in all of baseball, they are still the fifth, um, you know, the fifth best division leader out of six. So just something to keep in mind there. And finally, the AL West, um, unfortunately for Brianna, uh, it's looking like the Houston Astros, a two and a half game lead over the Oakland A's. Seattle sticking around somewhat. They're seven and a half games back and those Angels are 12 back. Brianna, in terms of the American League, Um, I don't think you're going to go out on a limb and say anything about the AL Central, but do you see any of those other uh, teams in the American League West or East that can kind of take down the Rays and Astros? Uh, The team that take down the Rays are going to be the are going to be the Red Sox if they can get back to how they were in the beginning. I'd love to see Oakland overtake Houston. I would love to see it, 
But at this point, I don't know if it's going to happen, no matter how much I want it to. Because look, the, if you look at the A's upcoming schedule, it's White Sox, Giants, Mariners, Yankees. So yeah, it's not looking good. No, and you know, I, and I have, agree. With they you. do have to play the they do have to play the Astros uh, two more times, there you uh, go. two more series, and including the very last Ooh. series of the season. Regular interesting. Season. Very interesting there. Uh, could see a possible three-game series to determine the, the division winner. And I think for Oakland right now, and, and even Boston, um, it's, it's just kind of, you know, obviously, look, win your games, control your destiny. That's the easy part. But also kind of understand that, you know, if they can stay within shouting distance, like you kind of brought up, at least with the A's and Astros, um, late in the year, they're going to have six games that probably will decide it. Um, I agree with you, though. I, I, I think Houston... I, I hate it. I hate to say it, um, even though I do have a bet in for them to win the American League, and it's looking good right now. But um, uh, the Astros, I would love to see them be taken down. Um, I really want to see the, the Rays continue uh, their kind of situation. I, I, I love the, the way the Rays play baseball, and um, hopefully Kevin Cash, if he gets another chance in the World Series, will not um, you know, pull his fantastic starter in Game 6. But Still a long way to go before we get to that, but I agree with you. I think Boston has the best shot. The Yankees have a good new lineup and all that stuff. I just don't think they have the kind of health, uh, long-term health that will get them there because you know Stanton and Judge probably have at least one more trip to the DL in them uh, between the two of them, so that could complicate things. But in terms of the National League, we'll start in the National League East as this has been by far the most competitive and most topsy turvy division in all of baseball the Atlanta Braves have finally gone over 500 and they have finally taken back first place uh, they have a one and a half game lead on the Philadelphia Phillies and a three and a half game lead on the Mets who have lost four straight and are three and seven in their last 10 after their little run um, so unfortunately the hobby bias trade didn't seem to work out at least not yet uh, the National League Central, very similar to the American League Central, pretty much already done and dusted. The Milwaukee Brewers have a seven and a half game lead on the Cincinnati Reds, 10 game lead on the, uh, on the Cardinals. And finally, unfortunately, the National League West, um, look, the Giants are still there. I think uh, to the shock of most people, they have a four game lead on the Los Angeles Dodgers and an 11 game lead on the San Diego Padres. Yeah, that got big real quick. Uh, but in the National League, Brianna, do you see anyone overtaking anyone? Probably uh, gonna be looking at that NL East, huh? Yeah, I'm looking at that NL East. It's if the Phillies can do it, then they're fine. The Mets are still in distance. I don't want the Dodgers to overtake the Giants. Although as I was covering uh, the Pro-Am and golf this weekend, I did meet a few Dodger fans who, when I said I wanted them to lose, they gave me a dirty look. Yeah. Like, and you're from LA. I'm like, yeah, and I don't like the Dodgers. And they just gave me some stink eye. <laughs> like they were mad at me. And I'm like, I, come on. I have to like one team and over the other. And it's just not the Dodgers. I don't want to see them win. Well, there's not too many people who are, who are just, neutral about the Dodgers it's kind of a love-hate thing right you either love them or you hate them it's like the Yankees no one's just kind of like oh the Yankees are or whatever you well, have you think a very it, strong opinion if you think about it it's also like colleges in Los Angeles it's either UCLA or USC and you and I both know what side we stand on and it's not the same so for all no. the all the viewers on on YouTube uh I got my USC helmet up no uh yes fight no. on um, no. F-U-C-L-A. Anyways. No. Uh, but... no, 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 no. You sure? Because it's the University of Spoiled Children, is it not? Ah, yes, yes. I, I've heard them all. If you wanted to uh, make a jab at the 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 um the mascot being named after maybe a, a prominent brand of condom, you can do that as well. I've pretty much heard them all. Um, the University of Spoiled Children is actually kind of ironic considering it comes from a UCLA fan, uh, you know, Westwood. I think the, the spoiled children but, per capita you, in uh, in Westwood a uh, little bit more in Watts, but but USC is a private school that yeah. costs more, so don't yeah. go there. 
<laughs> well, it's a better education, so you have to imagine no. it's going to cost more. Anyways, anyways, before we before we uh, turn this into a USC versus UCLA uh, rally, um, I agree with you though. I I obviously look the Dodgers done. I I I don't want them. So at this point, I am a de facto Giants fan. Um, unless you're a Dodger fan, I think most people are. Um, but I, I, I'm interested by, with the Braves because the Braves are that team that I think can actually compete with the Dodgers. Maybe not so much anymore because of what they've lost. But I think the Braves have a really good shot to win this. The Mets, um, that pitch, if they can get DeGrom back, you know, they, that gives them a shot. But I think the Giants, Braves, and Brewers are all pretty much I don't want to say locks, but really good bets to win their respective divisions. But with that, it is time to step into the winner's circle and see how those uh, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim and judging by Brianna's face right now, it might not be a yours is going to be worse. Oh, so. yeah. Mine's going to be worse. Yeah. Get the children out of the out of the earshot uh, for mine. But Brianna, it is all yours for now. Well, the Angels are three and seven in their last 10, but they've had a lot of like difficult series that they had to get past. And I'll go into that in a second. They have now designated Adam Eaton uh, for assignment and they did. So going into their series, they split their double header with the blue Jays. And then they lost on Wednesday, one on Thursday on Wednesday. The only two runs did come from Otani's 38th home run. And in that case, he brought Joe Adele home as well. On Thursday, in their win, Otani pitched uh, six innings, three hits, two earned runs, three walks, and six strikeouts, and he is now seven and one on the mound. Look, there's nobody else you can say that's going to be an MVP in the American League. You just can't. If Trout was playing, then you'd probably have him as a close second, but no one can beat Otani. If somebody beats Otani, I'm going to throw something and I'm sure you would too. Yeah. The only way you beat Otani in the main, in the MVP is if there's a rule or something that, that Shohei Otani essentially is a two person. So you would say Shohei Otani, the hitter and Shohei Otani, the pitcher. I think that's the only way. And I don't think that's been the case. No one's come out and said that Shohei Otani as a pitcher and Shohei Otani as a hitter is being judged differently. They are being judged together. It's even if Trout was there, I don't think anybody like I've been a firm believer that if Otani hits 20 home runs, hits 260 and has an ERA of four and wins seven, eight games on the mound, that is an MVP. He's done more value than anyone can. He his, is ERA, his ERA is under three. Too. Oh, yeah. 100, and he's got double that in the home runs. Yeah. So it's it's he could he could right now stop playing this year. Now, obviously, that's not the case. He would still be, I believe, unanimous MVP. Going into those pesky Astros, uh, the Angels are one and two. Um, Otani did hit his 39th home run in their first in the first inning of the eight to two loss on Saturday. On Sunday, though, Reed Detmers got his first win. The, uh, we took down the Astros three to one. Detmers uh, went six innings, three hits, one earned run, two walks, and six strikeouts. Look, he's been putting up those stat lines, and it's just been the bullpen not being able to help him. Obviously, the first game he got put in was the Dodgers, which did not help, but that was probably his worst stat line in his three games. But, I mean, this is something good to come. Obviously, he's still just a rookie, so we'll see more come out of him later. And then in terms of Joe Adele, he is definitely showing his defensive prowess. Well, he did a diving play near the foul line and he caught it. Nice. I think that little stint in the minors since last year definitely helped him. Ow. Um, and then they did just do their makeup game from July 1st against the Yankees. They did lose two to one. Upton homered in the first. Joey Gallo hit a two run home run in the second, or also in the first. Those were the only scores of the game. <laughs> Um, so then now going, looking into the series for the next week, they've got Detroit today through Thursday, Indians Friday through Sunday, and then they have a break. And then following their break is the Orioles. So they should be able to do something, especially since next week, 
we'll also see our two teams go up against each other for yeah. the first time this year. Yeah, it's and that's a be perfect segue to your Padres report. Yeah. Um, uh, look, folks, it's bad in San Diego. I mean, it's 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 beautiful in San Diego as I as I speak right now, to be honest. But baseball side of things, the Padres are a disaster, an unmitigated disaster, all pretty much by the doing in my mind of uh, from the top. I, I, I truly firmly believe Jace Tingler needs to go. It is time for us to get a manager who knows how to manage a bullpen, who knows that certain players need to be put in certain positions. Um, and then maybe in the post-game press conference, it's not a constant blessing of positivity and tomorrow will be a better day you just lost three out of four to the worst team in baseball and the cherry on top of that shit sandwich was a no hitter for a guy who was making his first career start this is a team whose payroll has been by far the most it's ever been and you can't get a single hit against the worst team in baseball this team lost 23 straight games on the road and you couldn't muster a single hit against a kid who had yet to make his first start for that team. The Padres are a joke, and everyone right now is laughing at them. We go into Sunday. Fernando Tatis comes back. They put him in right field. Fine. Okay, look, we know Fernando Tatis is not going to be a shortstop for very much longer. We've always known that. He just doesn't have the body type for it. Fantastic. We are six weeks away in the middle of a pennant chase, and this is when you turn him into an outfielder? You are setting these guys up for failure. I go back to last year going and talking about the 3 0 home run for Fernando Tatis. And he says, Oh, we're going to teach, or we're going to get Fernando to be better. How, Jace? How can he be better? By striking out, by getting no hit? Is that how you want him to get better? Because if that is the case, you are knocking it out of the park. Jace Tingler is a thorn in this team's side. I firmly believe if the Padres win anything with Jace Tingler as a manager, it will be in spite of him, not because of him. He is not ready to manage a big league baseball team, period. He may be down the road. He may be. But at what point, what do we waste waiting for Jace Tingler, waiting for A.J. Preller's best buddy to learn how to manage a major league baseball team? Win. Does that happen? Now, the only reason I'm not jumping through this screen and screaming even more than I already am is because the return of Fernando Tatis has at least given some positivity to Padre fans. And if you honestly believe Jake Arrieta is going to bring any positivity to Padre fans, you have absolutely no idea what's going on in San Diego. Because after an offseason in which A.J. Preller brings in Joe Musgrove, Hugh Darvish, and Blake Snell, we are six weeks away from the end of the season, and we are counting on Jake Arietta to save the day. Folks, what in the world is going on? This is a joke. This is a situation where now we're talking about in Padre, you know, Twitter land. Should we actually see if Jake Cronenworth can do something on the bump? Because look, he was kind of touted as a two-way player. He he pitched in the minors. Can Jake Cronenworth be a starter? Can Jake Cronenworth be somebody we rely on out of the bullpen? It blows my mind that we are in this spot. This team has been set up for success. They had the best offseason of any team in baseball. They got to a very good point with their pitching staff. Blake Snell has been wildly disappointing. Yu Darvish, at the very least, has been inconsistent. He has been very good at times. He has been very bad at times. And Joe Musgrove has by far been the best, has given the Padre fans their biggest memory, more than likely of this year, maybe of Padre fans' lifetime with that no-hitter. But he has struggled of late, as has Ryan Weathers. Chris Paddock is apparently, I mean, Padre fans, me, I'm one of the biggest Chris Paddock haters there is. And I'm looking at the DL hoping, man, I, I kind of hope he could come back. We just need some more bodies in that rotation as you Darvish has been placed on the DL again. It blows my mind that the Padres can continue to sprinkle rainbows and sunshines on this crap sandwich and expect San Diegans to continue to eat it. Now, I will say as a Padre fan, 
this is much later than it normally is when the wheels fall off. Now, obviously, last year was different. It was a 60-game season. You had eight teams making the playoffs. The Padres were never really under any pressure last year. They were always going to make the playoffs. They were never under any pressure last year. The first time this team gets put under a little bit of pressure, they fold like a napkin. Two weeks ago, I said, the Padres are going to play 13 games against the Rockies, Diamondbacks, and Marlins. They must go 10-3 and three to get that or to be still in the picture when it's all said and done. As I speak right now, 11 games have been completed. Two are yet to be. They are 5-6. and six. They are under 500 against three of the worst teams in baseball. The heads have to roll. This is unacceptable. And they won't roll, unfortunately. A.J. Preller and Jace Tingler are a package deal. I think A.J. Preller is a fantastic general manager. Just not great. Uh, not a fan of him hiring his best bud to be the manager of this baseball team. Now, Fernando Tatis coming back the night after, the day after they get no hit, I should say, he delivers four hits himself, including two home runs. If that's not just like a look into the dugout from a 21-year-old going, look, you grown-ass men, someone stand up. Someone be a leader on this team because Tatis, it's too much for him right now. He can't be a leader and be the best player on the team. You need someone else. You need Eric Hosmer to stand up. You need Manny Machado to stand up. Someone to flip some tables, get in their faces, and actually, you know, make people uncomfortable instead of just singing about Kumbaya and how great Joe Musgrove's coffee is. I just don't care anymore. I don't care how happy the locker room is. I don't care how the chemistry with the guys and they love hanging out with each other. Win ball games against bad baseball teams. That's your job, not to be friendly in the clubhouse. <sighs> Looking ahead for the Padres, it's not getting any easier. This stretch of the last month was their chance to win baseball games against bad teams. Guess what? They didn't do that. Now they have to win baseball team baseball games against good baseball teams. We're talking about 17 games in the next six weeks against the Dodgers and Giants. We talked about the Angels, four against the Angels in the next couple of weeks. The Astros are on there. You got three and a half games with the Braves. And the only reason I say a half is because one of those games, um, the Padres are technically already leading five to four, I believe in the sixth inning because it was a suspended game. But still, the Braves are on fire. Right after the Rockies, the Phillies come to town. Phillies are right on their tail. Two weeks ago, the Padres had a seven-game lead on the Cincinnati Reds. Now, as we speak, there are four teams that are within seven games of the Padres, including the Reds, who are only a game and a half back. That's all I got before I pass out. I, I'm, I'm so heated. I was as PG as I could have done it for you know everyone listening. I try not to curse. I might have dropped an S word in there. Hope I didn't drop an F bomb, but I might have. Uh, I do apologize, but for that, um, it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate the Padres are in the situation they are. But moving on, looking at the rest of the league, moving on to our three up, three down, we will do the first one. I had the ups this week. First one, of course, was the Atlanta Philly, or <laughs> excuse me, the Atlanta Braves. They um, obviously have taken over first place of the National League East for the first time this season, or at least for the first time. Uh, post early April. And uh, not only that, but I think it was two weeks ago, the Braves finally got over 500. They had been either at 500 or under 500 pretty much all season, but the Braves starting to play their best ball at the right time and have now taken over the division lead. Brianna, what are your thoughts on the Braves? Hey, look, the Braves are eight and two in their last 10. They're on a four game winning streak. They deserve to be up here, which is where we thought they were going to be at the beginning of the season. So they better stay there. So we're correct. Cause I don't know how long until the Phillies and the Mets can catch up. Yeah. It, the Mets, it'll depend on who's pitching and who they're playing. The Phillies just is going to depend on the game. Yeah. Phillies are just wildly inconsistent. I feel like the Phillies always have a situation of who the hell is going to close games out. That's their biggest question every single day. Um, and at least in Atlanta, they, they at least have somewhat of an idea. It's not perfect there, uh, but I agree with you. And this is kind of the route I thought the twins were going to take. Now, obviously that ship has long sailed, um, but I kind of, you know, they, the, the Braves struggled. The Braves were down, I think in fourth place at one point, um, you know, late May, early June. 
And this is a team that obviously lost their best player in Ronald Acuna, lost or at least never got one of their best pitchers in Mike Soroka back. And they have persevered through all that to get uh, up to first place. Um, and as someone who has, you know, multiple futures bets in on the Atlanta Braves, um, and one of my best friends is a diehard Braves fan, all I can say is go Bravos. Um, keep it up. Hopefully, uh, they can get it done. Um, yeah, I am a Philly kid, so I know there are plenty of Phillies fans that are screaming at their radios right now. But, um, you know, it is what it is. I think the Phillies, uh, they're, they're, they, they're not going to have a whole lot of success in the playoffs, in my mind, if they do win the division. But we'll see how that goes. And that is a perfect little segue into our first down, which Brianna had this week. Oh, it's the Philadelphia Phillies. But going back to that for a second. I mean, it could be worse. It could be all of us ganging up on you talking about the Eagles. Yeah. And believe me, um, I'll gang up and talk crap about the Eagles too, because it's going to be one of those years, unfortunately. It's going to uh, be the, one of those next few years. Well, hey, now, hey, I will give you this year, but I will not give you any more. Just this year. We'll see. A lot can change in the NFL. Teams can go from really bad to really good in one offseason. So I don't um, think it's Did probable. we not see what the Nationals and MLB did the other year? Well, okay, but once, I mean, the, 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 the roster dynamics in the NFL are a lot different than Major League Baseball. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I, I firmly believe that the, the Eagles, it might not be likely, but they can, you know, if they have a good offseason, they can at least, especially in that division, um, you know, but anyways, that was a. Uh, that division still sucks. It does. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, you still have an opportunity to, you know, don't have to be great, but that was a little bit of a cheap shot. I like it getting ready for football season. I enjoy that. Oh, well, I mean, preseason's already started. So yeah. why not start now? Amen. <laughs> so going back to the Phillies, they're six and four in their last 10, but look, they moved down to second. Like they're not, in first anymore, which is where they were in the last few weeks. And the Mets are two games behind them, basically on their tails. So if they want to stay in the playoff hunt, they need to stop losing. Yeah. Very... They, they need to not be in, they need to stay consistent. They really don't want the Mets catching up. I don't think they care if they're in second, as long as they're in the wild card hunt but they need to keep the Mets off of their butts. Definitely. And they're going to have a big series this weekend, obviously coming out here to San Diego to see the Padres. Um, and, and, you know, that, that could have big wild card implications. Um, so we'll, we'll see if the Phillies can, you know, try and make a move on Atlanta, but I agree with you. I think they're perfectly fine getting a wild card game um, and having an opportunity to throw Nola um, in a one game playoff should they so choose i think that would be uh what what their ideal scenario would be but the second up of the week is going to be the st louis cardinals obviously the cardinals um they've won six in a row they are eight and two in their last 10 uh, maybe a little too little too late they are 61 and 56 10 games out in the national league central however they are only four games back of the Padres um, for that wild card, uh, two and a half games back of Cincinnati. But obviously the St. Louis Cardinals playing good baseball. If they can get Flaherty back, that would be even better. Uh, and, and a team maybe to watch down the stretch to see what they can do. Uh, but Brianna, what are your thoughts? The St. Louis Cardinals making a bit of a late push. Is it going to be enough? Are they going to be able to overtake Cincinnati. I don't think so. I mean, it's great that they're doing well, but they should have done that months ago. Mm -hmm. They should have done that in the last few months. Now they are struggling to catch up. I mean, look, that division is basically done. They are two and a half games back of the Reds. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think, obviously, for St. Louis, it's an opportunity then to try and build. And, and who knows? I mean, obviously, look, if you keep this win streak going, uh, the sky's the limit. But I agree with you. Uh, they're going to get into it. I, I think a lot of the, the hard part for the Padres, obviously, September, most teams are playing in the division. Uh, the National League Central, when you look at, you know, the Pirates and the Cubs, 
a lot easier meet there um, than what the Padres will have to deal with, with the, you know, Dodgers and Giants, but St. Louis still, still within, you know, arm's length, uh, shouting distance, uh, but we'll see how the rest of the year goes down. Uh, our second down of the week, Brianna, what do we got? I think everybody in the central that's not named the White Sox or the Indians need to be retired from the down list. Yeah. But I am going to put one of them in anyway. Uh, it is going to be the Kansas City Royals. They are three and seven in their last 10. Look, the Twins have been in last in that division for a long time. Not anymore. Kansas City has now taken up that mantle. But again, this is a division that's non-existent anymore. This is a division that nobody really needs to look at anymore unless it's the White Sox and the Reds or Indians, my bad. <laughs> but I mean, Detroit is making a push. Yeah, I think Detroit the, Detroit's is, making a push. They, but, they've been great. But at the same time, everybody that's not the White Sox or the Indians should not be on the down list anymore. <laughs> yeah. In that division. Yeah. And for the for the twins, obviously they're on a little bit of a hot streak. But yeah, Kansas City, uh, they're they're obviously continuing to look ahead. They it's so sad. They had those two great years um, where they were going to the World Series, and then it seemed to just kind of all fall apart. Uh, obviously, a very small market team. They're not going to go out and spend money, so very reliant on their prospects coming up. Obviously, Bobby Witt, one of the top prospects in baseball. Maybe he can do something, but for the foreseeable future, I think the Kansas City Royals are going to be kind of the dumpster divers. You know, at least with the with the Tigers, even last year, they may have struggled. But, you know, when we talked earlier, before the season started, I think my bold prediction was the Detroit Tigers weren't going to finish in. They were, I think I said they were going to finish in third place. Um, and I said it, fourth. Yeah, and it looks like that. But I think the biggest thing is that young pitching is starting to finally get there. Spencer Torkelson for the Tigers has moved all the way up to AAA, so we may see him very soon. But Kansas City, that's they're the ones right now that um, that that dumpster or that cellar is theirs. Uh, Minnesota, I, I mean, I guess they can feel good. They're no longer in last place, but for a team that I think most people expected at the very least to at least compete with the White Sox or wh whoever in this division, for them to be 16 games out and essentially COVID. already eliminated, it's terrible. COVID. Yeah. COVID I mean, is the main answer to it because I, I got to disagree to that. I think well, last year you could have said that, but when you talk about losing that, that was, that was almost four, four or five months ago. I, but, they, not, but they've I had games here and make excuses for us. They have one COVID outbreak in March or in April. Um, they haven't done anything in the last three months. Uh, I, I don't believe that was part of it, but who knows? No, what I'm saying is like the once they went down that entire team went down for COVID basically like that's basically where the angels downfall started was because of that postponement as well the twins have just struggled since that and I don't know the reason we all thought that they were going to do better I thought second you thought first I'm glad I said White Sox yeah uh, but it, it's just since they had gone down with COVID everything has been different for them yeah just like with angels ever since that series had gotten postponed some of those games in that series got postponed. They started playing like trash, except for Otani, of course. Yeah. And then Trout ended up going down, which didn't help their case. So it just depends on the one injuries, two, COVID, yeah. and three, the the end of the season for them has is going to be rough. Yeah, and their their pitching has been pretty bad as well. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. AL Central, unless you're the White Sox. Adios. Um, you know, the White Sox are essentially just just trying to play out the games, trying to stay healthy. Um, you know, because obviously they know that if someone gets hurt, it's probably going to be for the rest of the year. That's just kind of how it's been for them still powering through. But the final up of the week is, unfortunately for me, uh, sticking in the National League West. Why are you saying, is, unfortunately, they're keeping the Dodgers at bay? Yeah, but it's <laughs> still not great for me because I, uh, I, I, need to, I, I would like to see the Padres a little closer to that division lead. But it is the San Francisco Giants who have won eight or um, excuse me, they are eight and two in their last 10. They've won two straight. This is a team I think most people all expected to kind of calm down, um, especially this late in the year. That is not the case. Still the best team in baseball, 35 games above 500. Uh, it, it's, it's all going right in San Francisco. And as you said, they are keeping the Dodgers at bay. 
four game lead on those Dodgers. Um, Gabe Kapler, manager of the year. I don't think anybody can doubt that or, um, you know, kind of say anybody else. Someone will finish in second. Good for them. But Gabe Kapler, manager of the year, book it. Uh, Brianna, what are your thoughts on the San Francisco Giants? If you want a chance at the playoffs, you got to catch the Dodgers. Don't worry about the Giants. Just catch the freaking Dodgers. We don't need them winning again. Not happening. I don't care. The Dodgers are the team that you actually have to catch up to, not the Giants. Yeah, well, but, that's, I mean, that's, that's like saying that you have to go catch that cheetah before you catch the, uh, the, the uh, muscle car. I'm not going to catch either. Look, of them. the Giants are making the, the playoffs, whether you like it or not. It's the yeah. Dodgers that we don't want making the playoffs. So you've got to start oh, winning. That's not going to happen. The Dodgers are making the playoffs. No matter what the Padres do, the Dodgers are making the playoffs. I don't like hearing that. Don't, don't <laughs> say that again. Don't say that again. I mean, look, I thought the Giants were going to be in third this entire season because we knew that the Rockies weren't going to compete. We knew the Diamondbacks weren't going to compete. We thought it was going to be a two-team race between the Dodgers and the Padres. I mean, San Francisco has shocked everybody, and I'm kind of happy about it (laughs) because it's not the Dodgers. I would have liked it to be um, a nice surprise as they were in, you know, second place behind the Padres, but that has not been the case. The Giants, though, obviously getting it done the way they always have the ballpark. They, they, they go out great pitching, um, good timely hitting, uh, and good defense. They obviously have gotten a lot of help from their aging superstars uh, in Longoria and um, uh, Buster Posey returning back. Uh, but Chris Bryant obviously coming in as well has been a great addition. Kevin Gosman maybe having a career year, possible Cy Young um, if, if uh, we don't see DeGrom back this year. Uh, and, and, and it's really something now because they've beaten the hell out of the Dodgers. This isn't a situation where the Dodgers beat the crap out of the Giants but struggle against other teams. The Giants have very easily taken control of the Giants when they've played. Um, I think the division... Not necessarily wrapped up, but I think I would be very, very surprised to see any change. I think the Giants are going to win the West, which if I had to choose anybody besides the Padres, it would, of course, you know, obviously be the Giants or anybody but the Dodgers. So it is a bit bittersweet. Um, you know, I'm not a big Giants guy myself, but Brianna, final down of the week. Going off of Chris Bryant, why couldn't he do what he's doing now with the team we're about to talk about? Come on. Um, So the final down is the Chicago Cubs. Look, they have lost 12 straight. They are 0-10 in their last 10. They are just sinking farther and farther. Look, they are 21 games back of Milwaukee. And this was a team that was leading the National League Central at one point. And then once they, uh, yes, they struggled prior to the trade deadline, but don't trade your main people who have been there who have been, who were helping you and look what happened. I'm not sorry. (laughs) Yeah. At at this point, I'm not sorry because of what they did. This is all because of the players that they got in return. This is all because of their farm system that has not been doing well. Yes. There's still a few of those core members left like Contreras and Hap, but like, come on. Well, I think, the writing was on the wall this year, coming into this year. They had a chance, though, prior to the trade. No, one hundred percent. Yeah, and and that twelve. They, so they. So I'll, we'll go back to the Alec Mills, or I think it was a combined no hitter. Alec Mills was last year's no hitter, but that combined no hitter at Dodger Stadium, top of the world for the Cubs. They're in first place, maybe the best team in baseball. I don't know if they were at that time, but they definitely were in first place in the division. Don't, playing very very well. They then lose 12 or 11 in a row after that. Currently, as we are now there in 12 game losing streak, but going back to that 11 game losing streak, you brought it up. That was their death sentence. Once that happened, the general managers for the Cubs decided we got to blow this up. Now it was a terrible 24 hours for Cubs fans. However, it was a terrible week. Yeah, it was. Um, But you weren't re-signing all three of those guys. That was obvious. At least let you might not even have the season. Uh, well, okay, but hold on. Let me let me explain to you why. If I was a Cubs fan, I'd be frustrated. But you have to understand that this this is the right thing to do. If you let these guys walk out on free agency, 
You don't get anything. Maybe you get a compensatory pick late. Okay, that's fine, whatever. But in this situation, I look at the Mets. Look, they sent Javi Baez to the Mets. Javi Baez beloved in Chicago. I understand that. Pete Crow Armstrong, I think, is a really talented young player. You talked about the frustrations in the farm system. The amount of players the Cubs brought in is going to help that farm system. This is a full rebuild. Well, three or four years down the road. This is a full rebuild. This isn't a situation where they can, it's kind of like what I talked about earlier with with roster um, construction, NFL versus Major League Baseball. You're not going to get that good when you're a last place team to a first place team overnight um, in the off season because you're depending on so many young players in these farm systems. I think the Cubs in three or four years um, will be able to go out very similar in the early 2000s. This is how they got, you know, obviously drafted Chris Bryant, signed Javi Baez, traded from the Padres, Anthony Rizzo, um, Jake Arrieta as well. There were a lot of under um, underrated moves that got them there. It's unfortunate. It would have been great if everyone gets signed. It would have been great if this team was competing because if this team was competing and right now they were five games out behind the Brewers, then all three of those guys would still be here. But the fact that they were essentially, the the team looked in the mirror and said, we're not doing anything this year. We need to get rid of these three guys and get some more players in. Um, It's unfortunate, but it is kind of the way that general managers go about their business these days, but they're paying the price for it right now. It's, another bad bad year uh but they are still nine games ahead of the pirates so i don't think they're going to be in finish in last place but at the same time they still had a chance for a wild card well they had a chance but they didn't have a ch- they had a chance when they threw that no hitter and then it all when you lose 11 straight games that goes away you don't have that anymore even if all three of these guys were on this team and they weren't traded the cubs might not be on a 12 game losing streak but they're not in the wild card picture unfortunately. So it sucks as a Padre fan. This is, this is my life. I mean, Adrian Gonzalez, Jake Peavy, um, and countless other players. Once they hit that free agent year, you know, they're going to be traded. Um, and unfortunately for the Cubs, they had to eat that one this year. It was a little tough when it's all three at once, but so. Plus Kimbrell. Oh. Yeah. And Kimbrell, that's true. Kimbrell as well. I mean, yeah, there, it wasn't just the big Arietta, three. I, I could care it, less for. <laughs> yeah, well, was, I think I'm sorry. Three, yeah. Well, the big three that were moved, that was kind of, um, it, those were the guys who were there who won it, who ended the curse. Kimbrell wasn't there. He wasn't even a, a thought at that point. So those three guys will always have a special heart or a special place in Cubs fans uh, memories, just because they were on that team that broke the curse. But Brianna, final thoughts uh, for another episode here of The Changeup. I'm very disappointed in my teams. I'm very disappointed in yours. Yeah, you're, uh, the disappointment you have in your two teams, you can combine that, roll it up in a ball, throw it, hit me in the face, knock me out. Um, that's where I'm at with my team because I've been a Padre fan, obviously, a very long time, um, ever since I can remember. We'll call it 30-plus years without dating myself. And then... Knowing that this team has the opportunity to, you know, do something, make the playoffs, a real playoff, not an 18 playoff, not a 60 game season playoff. And then this is happening. I mean, two weeks ago, it was a foregone conclusion. Essentially, the Padres were going to at the very least be wild card number two. Now, nothing is foregone in that wild card race other than the fact that the either Los Angeles Dodgers or San Francisco Giants, whoever's second in that division, they'll get the first wild card. Um, I don't think anyone's bringing them down. San Diego Padres have to figure it out, period. Jace Tingler has to get better quick. He doesn't know how to take care of a bullpen. We need, can't believe I'm saying this, but we need Jake Arrieta to beat Jake Arrieta. I mean, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at as a Padre fan. August 17th, and I'm hoping a newly released Jake Arrieta is the savior. If that's not a perfect microcosm for how terrible the Padres season has been going as of right now, I don't know what is, folks, but with that, thank you all very much for listening to The Changeup, presented by the First Off the Bench Podcast Network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. It is time for you all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. We all talk to you all very soon. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll be a lot more positive next week, but that's all going to depend on those pesky Padres. So take care, everyone. We'll talk to you all very soon.